This is a joint presentation uh, with Dong Xi in East Hanover, my colleague, and, and Mili Maurer, uh, who unfortunately passed away already a few years ago, but it has been ongoing work that started off um, jointly with Mili a few years ago. And I will be talking about a very specific problem. I have a little message here. Um, I'm not sure, uh, can you click that away? I don't know. Okay, six. And it's a very specific problem that we have in drug development, mainly that um, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, the regulatory agency in the US, has a very specific requirement that whenever you want to submit a drug for market approval, you need two positive confirmatory trials. So um, you need two phase three trials that are both um, identical in design or at least very similar in design and very similar population with the same endpoints. And you need both of these trials to be positive um, typically. So this is what is um, required by the FDA as a guideline from 1998, which more recently has been updated, but essentially still talks about this two study paradigm. And there are many examples of diseases under this two study paradigm. Um, and it comes under the heading of replication or it's being motivated under the heading of replication, independent substan substantiation and so on. Um, there are uh, situations where single study approvals are possible, but they are really limited to what's called mortality or irreversibility morbidity settings, um, like in oncology. Um, yeah, so that is one of the few areas. Or if you have in a very rare disease or it's in a pediatric, um, uh, pediatric indication, but this is really um, like the exception to the rule. And, but even if you do a single study approval, then you need statistically very persuasive and very low p-values. But the principal problem is, uh, the principal, uh, the general situation is really that we need two positive confirmatory studies. Now, another important aspect when you think about drug approval is that, that you need to control your type one error rate within a study. More specifically, we need to control the family device error rate so the probability to reject at least one true null hypothesis within a study. Um, more specifically, um, we need a strong family device airway control. So that is, we need to control the family device airway under any configuration of the unknown parameters. And this has to be controlled at a pre-specified significance level alpha, which is typically two and a half percent one-sided or five percent two-sided. Now, um, this family device airway uh, control is very well known, it's documented in various regulatory guidelines, such as um, two guidelines mentioned here by the FDA in the US and the European Medicines Agency in Europe, both from 2017. They're very consistent in the requirements. Um, and when it comes to strong family device airway control, what you need is a prospective analysis plan. You need to um, specify um, you know, your test strategy in your study protocol. You need a very clear um, careful classification of your endpoints for your multiplicity adjustment. So you need to specify upon what are the hypotheses that you want to test, which ones are primary, which ones are secondary, and then you need the proper statistical adjustment methods in place. And again, you need to control the family device area within each study. Now, the principles extend to multiple doses, subgroups, time point analysis, um, and so that goes beyond just two endpoints, although most of my presentation will be about endpoints, but the principles extend beyond in terms of the re requirements from the uh, regulatory agencies and what my presentation is about. How, however, there's now a problem and um, now we're getting um, warmed up now um, that sometimes um, we need very different sample sizes to achieve a certain power, say 80% for different endpoints. So, um, you know, we, we have, um, you know, we work a lot in respiratory studies. And so a short-term symptomatic endpoint like FEV1, which is the, uh, 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 the forced expiratory volume one second, it's a lung parameter. Um, where if you have a certain uh, sample size for that FEV1 parameter, it could be very different sample size that you would need for a hard clinical endpoint, such as, um, yes, exacerbations in COPD um, studies. So sometimes, um, you know, the sample size that you would need for a hard clinical endpoint could be easily twice as large as you would need for your short-term symptomatic endpoint 
to achieve the same power twice. And this unbalanced sample size requirements um, in terms of resources, the impact of a single study would be magnified or amplified if you have a two study paradigm. And sometimes you may even run three studies in order to get two of them positive and significant. So this sample size requirements for the hard clinical endpoints are quite uh, limiting. So you could think about as one solution is that you pool the data from the two studies for your hard clinical endpoint, which I denoted as E2, which if you were allowed to do that, uh, you would not have to double the sample size. You could essentially use the sample size for each study, and then you pull the data, do a pooled analysis for your hard clinical endpoint. <clears throat> now, obviously, this is not so straightforward. Otherwise, we would all be doing that, and we would, in the end, not even run two trials anymore because we would just run one single trial from the beginning on. So, um, of course, pooling data uh, from two studies increases statistical efficiency. Um, there are different ways how to pool it. You can think about a naive pooling. You can do it, obviously, in a more sophisticated way doing sort of systematic meta-analytic approach, using study as a stratification factor and so on. And obviously um, any, any pooling exercise, you need a careful examination um, about the poolability of the studies and to which degree they are indeed similar um, to avoid systematic bias and difference. So there are many different aspects that go into whether we actually can perform a pooled analysis at all. And clearly that would only be possible if we really are talking about hard clinical endpoints where the regulatory agencies would agree that, well, if you wanted to collect data, patients per study would be infeasible. They, so we would have to have this basic agreement. But the topic of my presentation today is not about all these aspects, but this is a statement from Lisa Lavanche, um, who used to be the head of biostatistics at, at FDA, um, at the Center of Drug Evaluation, CDER. So, and she was <coughs> in 2019 asking this question, what approaches could be considered for managing multiplicity when data on an endpoint from two or more trials are planned to be pooled and each trial had multiple endpoints managed. So we have a very specific multiplicity problem that I want to talk today, because you're going to control the family bias error rate in each study. However, we are also talking about a pooled analysis, which is not done on a study level. So how do you now fit your pooled analysis under your family bus error rate control testing scheme, because the concept of your study level family bus error rate control does not apply to the pooled analysis. And still, you want to somehow control your type 1 error rate or minimize your wrong decisions. So, this is the basic question. And it's not completely clear how you do that. Um, so, how you go beyond your standard family bus error rate control per study and what would be a reasonable approach. And so there are some ideas in this presentation along these lines. I don't think we have the ultimate final answer. Um, certainly we don't, but at least some ideas for considerations and we implemented in a couple of studies and we got positive feedback from regulatory agencies. And so this is some of the experiences I wanted to share today. But also I guess there's still room or there's definitely room for, uh, for research in this area, if, if, anyone, if anyone is interested to think more um, fundamentally about this problem. I think it's still an open question. So um, I will be focusing mostly on multiple endpoints. Later on, I will have you know, two case studies with a couple of extensions. Um, so the principles um, on which the following proposals will be based is first, we need strong family bus airway control within each of the two confirmatory studies. So that's the basic setting. And we need, as FDA requires us, to run two pivotal trials, two confirmatory trials. So we need some sort of a confirmation of an independent substantiation from at least one other endpoint prior to the pooled analysis. So this should somehow, this independent substantiation should reflect um, the requirement from the FDA that we need two significant results in these two studies. And we introduce a concept of submission-wise error rate as opposed to family-wise error rate um, across both studies at an appropriate level. So the family-wise error rate is within each study and the submission-wise error rate is across both studies on the, on, on the project, on the program level rather than on a study level. 
And this is about the probability to make a false claim of success for an endpoint while taking into account that the significant result on the same endpoint has to be um, obtained in both studies. So this would be a submission wise error rate. So the setting, a bit more formal now, um, we're talking uh, mostly about two endpoints. Later on, we will also have uh, multiple endpoints, but we start off with two endpoints where E2 would typically require twice the sample size of E1 to satisfy a reasonable power. And then the two study paradigm means that we have two identically and independent, identically designed and independent phase three trials. And we are testing the same hypothesis in both trials. So H1 and H1 prime are the two hypotheses for endpoint E1, our short-term biomarker in study one and two respectively. So um, the prime notation denotes a hypothesis in the second pivotal trial. So we have H1 and H1 prime for the short-term endpoint E1 and then like FEV1. And then we have H2 and H2 prime for our hard clinical endpoint E2. Okay. But as I said, sometimes we would like to do a pooled analysis for E2. And if that is true, then we are going to test H2 tilde which uses the data from both studies and is to denote the hypothesis for your pooled analysis for your hard clinical endpoint E2. And in the following, we will have different strategies depending on the role of your pooled analysis. Um, the most common problem we have seen is if the pooled analysis is a secondary endpoint or is a secondary analysis. So I will start off with that. But we will also talk a little bit about primary and co-primary endpoints situations, although I haven't seen any real applications yet. Okay, and so I'm going through these three case, cases, secondary, prime, and co-primary, and um, you know, provide some ideas how testing could be performed within each study and across the study while controlling the type 1 airway in a suitable sense. And actually, we have multiple type 1 airways, a family-wise airway and a submission-wise airway. So starting with the pooled analysis as a secondary analysis. So um, consider these two endpoints, E1 is primary, E2 is secondary. If we don't do a pooled analysis, uh, what we will then do is typically within each study, a hierarchical test. And um, in study one, you would, for example, first test H1 at level alpha, two and a half percent one-sided. And if rejected, then we would test H2 at two and a half percent. Okay, so this is the left figure, and on the right figure, you would have the same test strategy for um, study number two, where we test H1 prime and H2 prime accordingly. So these would be two totally independent analyses: um, one for uh, study one, one for study two, so that the family-wise airway within each study is well controlled because we have our hierarchical test. We test E1 and E2 at 2.5%, but also the submission-wise airway across both studies is well controlled at 0.025 squared because we are performing each um, strategy at level 2.5%. These are independent analysis, so essentially um, you get to the square here. Okay, so this is the situation if you don't do a pooled analysis, but now let's consider if we do a pooled analysis. If you, if you do a pooled analysis for your secondary endpoint, and now you start how it starts changing. So we have study one and study two, we test H1 and H1 prime, but for the um, secondary endpoint E2, we don't test H2 and H2 prime, but rather we do the pooled analysis H2 tilde. And the question is then at which level you can test H2 tilde, and we argue that you can test it at level two and a half percent if and only if both H1 and H1 prime are rejected before. And this is indicated by these two arrows. So if you reject H1 and H1 prime both, each at two and a half percent, then you can test H2 tilde at full level alpha. So what I said, now being displayed, study one, you test H1 at two and a half percent, study two, you test H1 prime at two and a half percent, 
And if both are rejected, then you can test H2 tilde um, using data from both studies, but also at level two and a half percent. And um, you would then control the family wise air weight within each study at two and a half percent. And the submission wise air weight is then controlled at 2.5% uh, squared. You have your requirement of independent substantiation via your E1 endpoint. So because you can test H2 tilde only after having rejected H1 and H1 prime, and your significance level alpha of 2.5% for H2 tilde is determined by conventional level of proof for a single hypothesis. So this sounds pretty simple, and, but it, it's helpful to go through the simple case first because it helps setting the scene um, for the more complicated case if we now add yet another secondary endpoint, E3. And now it gets a bit more tricky. If you do a pooled analysis, um, you see the following now. So E3, you would like to test not on the pooled level, but you would like to test in the per study level. So now you see the complication kicking in, is that you test H1 and H3, but you would also like to test H2 tilde, right? And so you, and likewise, you have H1 prime and HC prime. The concept of the family wise error weight does not apply anymore because the family wise error weight is only within study one or within study two, but somehow you have to control the type one error weight for H2 tilde, and you're suggesting to consider something like the submission wise error. So this is the concept behind this figure. Um, for those of you who know the graphical approach, um, this is not quite a graphical approach here. So this is more an intuitive explanation how decisions are being done. So please don't, don't get confused if you know the graphical approach. It's not that one. It's more to illustrate the thinking and the decision process. But the idea is that you test H2 tilde only if you have rejected H1 and H1 prime first. And you test H3 only if you have rejected H1 first, and you test H3 prime only if you have rejected H1 prime. So this H1 and H1 prime, the two primary and the, the, the two primary hypotheses for study one and study two, really serve as quote unquote gatekeeper for H3, H3 prime, and H2 tilde. So, and the final thing is you have to think about. Um, what is the significance level that you use for H2 tilde? Well, we are suggesting that you want to control the type 1 airway across all these secondary endpoints. And, um, and this gives you alpha minus alpha squared is essentially a bond foronization step across H3, H3 prime, and H2 tilde. So that's the basic idea um, how you set um, the significance level. So, in summary, um, we do a hierarchical test within each study for e, E1 and E3. And if both H1 and H1 prime rejected, then you will test H2 tilde at level alpha minus alpha squared. And this is the Bonferroni split between H3, 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 H3 prime and H2 tilde. That's the, it's, that's the motivation where you get this alpha minus alpha squared from. And if you think through this, then you will some, then you will recognize that the family device error weight, of course, is controlled within each study for E1 and E3. The submission wise error weight is controlled, and the independent substant substantiation, your replication, is achieved through your gatekeeping requirements at H1 and H1 prime. Both have to be significant. So you control your submission wise error weight. And also you control the family of airway across the family of all secondary endpoints, um, E2 and E3. Okay. And this is a figure that we will see in a couple of applications that we will see later on in, in, in that we discussed also with agencies. This is a basic figure. Um, but now um, I rather would like also to go to some other situations uh, where the pooled analysis is not uh, the role of a secondary analysis, but as a primary or as a co-prime analysis. So first we consider the situation of the pooled analysis being a primary analysis. So again, we have back to two endpoints, E1 and E2. Both are primary. That means that if, either e, if you have significance on either E1 or E2, you get a significant result. 
Um, therefore, you will typically have to adjust for multiplicity for E1 and E2. And you know, a simple one is that you use the bond veroni test within each study. And that's why you see at the bottom, you know, the display that we test H1 and H2 each at level alpha over two, and likewise H1 prime and H2 prime. Um, now, that would guarantee that your family bus airway is well controlled. It's just a, it's a standard bond um, adjustment, but also your submission device airway is also controlled because you're requesting that um, you uh, in order to have a significant submission or you're ready for submission, you need to reject both H1 and H1 prime or H2 and H2 prime each at the bond level. So that's the idea. Okay. And that's what we conventionally would do. Now, um, if you do a pooled analysis for E2, then the situation changes a little bit that now we have only H1 and H1 prime, each tested at level alpha over two. And then, um, you know, again, using a Bonferroni adjustment, alpha squared minus alpha over two squared, that gives you the significance level for H2 prime. So, um, you test H1 and H2 prime at alpha over two, and you test uh, H2 tilde at this bond for an I split across all the uh, primary hypothesis. That guarantees you that you have a family device airway per study, well controlled, because you only have E1 to test, and um, a submission wise airway uh, would be still controlled at level 0.025 square. The difficulty here is that if only H2 tilde is significant, but not both H1 and H1 prime, you don't have formally your independent substantiation as required by the FDA. Typically, you have two independent p-waves that are both significant. So this independent substantiation may be questioned if either H1 or H1 prime is not significant. And as I said um, very early on, we have not seen an application of this sort of question even coming up. So um, we don't have experience with this sort of technique, but this is or uh, what we might suggest eventually. So this is if the pooled analysis is um, used as a primary analysis. And the final situation is if the pooled analysis is used as a co-primary analysis, the distinction between primary and co-primary endpoints means primary endpoints you can um, win on either E1 or E2. Co-primary means that you have to win on both E1 and E2 is a different requirement. And now I'm considering co-prime analysis. If you have two endpoints without a pooled analysis, then we will test H1 and H2 each at level two and a half percent. That is what you would typically do. You need a significant result for both H1 and H2. This is what you would do. Likewise with H2. And you would claim study success only if both hypotheses are rejected in both, hypoth uh, both hypotheses uh, for one study, and you would go to submission if both hypotheses are rejected in both studies. That would be then on the submission level. So in summary, you would therefore control the uh, family device air weight at you know, level alpha, two and a half percent, and likewise the submission air device air weight at two and a half percent squared. Now, if you do it with a pooled analysis, so you, uh, where the pooled analysis is one of the two components of your co-prime analysis, then we would have only H1 and H1 prime both to be tested at two and a half percent and H2 tilde would then also be tested at two and a half percent, but it's only based on H2 tilde, like the pooled data. Um, and that would be determined by the conventional level of proof for a single hypothesis. Um, now, in summary, the family device error rate would be controlled, likewise the submission-wise error rate, and um, your independent substantiation would come through E1. Now, you could argue that your significance level H2 prime um, doesn't have to be alpha, but maybe it would have to be more strict and somewhere in the range of alpha squared to alpha um, um, in order to balance the level of replication standard and the feasibility of the trial. So here the situation, it's not clear what exactly the type one airway, uh, the significance level for H2 tilde would be. Um, testing at level alpha might be the most liberal one, but um, um, one could argue that you would have to um, test it at alpha 
alpha squared if you really want to build in your replication standard also for into the analysis of H2 prime. But like as with the primary analysis, we haven't seen a situation for co primary analysis in practice yet. So, so these are just some general ideas and work in progress, so to speak. But instead, I would now like go back to the um, first situation where the pooled analysis was a secondary endpoint or it was a secondary analysis. And I would like to um, showcase um, a real case, uh, which, uh, a, a real study where we actually used it um, also in discussions with regulatory agencies. So these are the so-called Asclepius one and two studies. So these were two confirmatory trials with identical design in patients with multiple sclerosis. And the primary endpoint was analyzed relapse rate, which is a relatively like it's not a hard clinical endpoint. The hard clinical endpoint is about disability progression. So, and actually we had multiple versions of this hard clinical endpoint. So you see it here, we had disability worsening after three months, after six months and disability improvement after six months. So we had three key secondary endpoints for the hard clinical endpoint around disability progression. And we had another three key secondary endpoints around MRI and, 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 and other bio and, and a biomarker called neurofilament light chain. And uh, so this is just additional, um, additional key secondary endpoints. Um, the point is that um, you could you know, do your sample size calculation and you come up with about 900 patients that you would need per trial to get 90% power to detect a 40% lower analyzed relapse weight which is this 900 patients per trial, and it seems to be feasible according to the clinical team. However, if you translate this 900 patients, um, combining the data from both trials, you get 1800 patients, then you would get a 90% power or 80% power detect um, uh, a, a 38.6 lower risk of disability worsening at three months or six months. So, um, these 1800 patients would then be the requirement for your pooled analysis in order to detect this 38.6% um, um, uh, of lower risk. Um, and um, if you would calculate backward what you would have to do, if you would not be allowed to do the, um, the pooled analysis, then you can imagine then having 1800 patients in each trial, um, um, yeah, gives you 30, uh, 3,600 patients, or if you would require the 900 patients in each trial, if you would keep it at the 900 patients, but you would have to do separate analysis, you would have much, much less power for your clinically hard endpoint of disability progression. Um, so this was the situation, and um, we discussed with FDA, and it was, it was accepted, and the, the, the results were then uh, published in this, um, you see this, the quotation, the reference at the top, it's a New England Journal of Medicine paper from the clinical team. And this was our testing scheme in the end. So you see in the testing scheme, um, in the first column, these are the hypotheses related to study 2301, it's the one pivotal trial. Then we have the study 2302, this is the second pivotal trial. And then here you have the hypothesis related to your pooled analysis. So um, if for Within each trial, you are going to test the analyzed relapse rate. This is really H1 and H1 prime. And then you have here in sequence all the MRI or imaging data plus your biomarker endpoint here. And these are all tested sequentially. Um, so you start off testing first. Uh, your, the numbers to mention uh, indicate at which level you will test the various hypotheses in sequence. So you need to start off testing H1, if rejected, you test H3, H4, H5, and H, no, well, whatever the numbers are, three, four, six, and eight, and likewise, the H1 prime, H3 prime, and so on. But if you can reject H1 prime and H1, H1 and H1 prime, then you're also allowed to branch off and test the endpoints related to disability progression. So these are H2, H5, and H7 in this numbering scheme here. And you see at which levels we would test those endpoints. Um, so, and you, you see that within a certain hierarchy at a certain level, um, we use this alpha minus alpha squared so that we can kind of use a Bonferroni approach um, for this um, given um, segment of um, 
of hypothesis, secondary hypothesis. So you see, this is an extension of one of the diagrams I had shown before. Essentially, H1 and H1 prime are used as like the prime endpoints. Um, and if both are significant, you're allowed to branch off to H2. If only H1 or H1 prime is significant, then you're at least still allowed to test within the study um, those endpoints related on the study level. Okay, did it work? Well, here are now the results. Um, as I said, we used this 900 patients. So in, in the end, we used 946 and 936 patients were randomized to receive either our drug or fatumunuab or receive the active control. And all the results were um, like confidence, inter uh, confidence intervals and p-values were presented without any further adjustments, multiplicity adjustments. And so the results were as follows, that first, um, you obviously are interested in your primary endpoint results. And you get here um, the significant results of 0 .0, uh, less than 0 0.001 in both studies. Um, so this is good news, so that you can continue testing throughout, for example, your first study, and you see what the results are. You continue testing, and actually there's a typo at the very bottom. It shouldn't be 0 .0, uh, 0 0.012, but should be 0.12, it's 12%. So that's why it's marked on red because it was not significant. But you see that we can um, test through all the study one hypothesis and we get all the rejections except for the very last one in the hierarchy. And likewise in study two, we had very similar results. And again, I had a similar typo at the bottom. It should be uh, uh, 0.13 instead of 0.013. So, and then you, in addition, you have your tests on the right-hand side for your disability progression, and you're going to test those with your alpha minus alpha squared bond Ferroni splits at each time, and you, con you test sequentially through these three hypotheses as long as you reject, and in this case, we were able to reject at least the first two hypotheses, H2 and H5. So this will guarantee you, um, along the lines as I had indicated before, you have family device airway control within each study, and you have your submission device airway control across uh, uh, both studies for your, um, end, your disability progression related endpoints. And because we had multiple end hypotheses related to disability progression, we also used, so to speak, the family device airway concept for all the hypotheses related to the disability progression. Um, yeah, and so these were these results were the basis for our submission for this product based on these two phase three trials. Um, good. So this is the situation if you are talking about multiple endpoints, but sometimes we have a couple of um, extensions coming up, and one extension is if you have more than one dose, and um, yeah, then the graph becomes more complicated. So what is the situation here? Um, so we have on the left-hand side, um, study one, the box. On the right-hand side is study two. And in the middle, we have our combined analysis. Then we have from top to bottom, our various endpoints. And we have within each box, two doses. So we have two doses, three endpoints for each of the two confirmatory trials, the left box and the right box. These are the two confirmatory trials, so we have for each trial, we have six hypotheses. And in addition, we have one hypothesis which we would like to test using a combined analysis for the two doses. And here the complication is that obviously you have to adjust also for the doses. So you can't just do, or the team didn't want to do just a simple hierarchical testing as a few slides ago, where within each study, we just had a hierarchical test but here it becomes um, a bit more complicated. Actually, we use, in this case, we have now a graphical approach. So all the solid lines within a box is, follows the graphical approach for those who know this approach, so that you do control your type one air, family device area within each study, that is within each box. And you see you're splitting the alpha into four fifths and one fifths for H1 and H2, and then you test sequentially through your three endpoints. And if you can reject all the endpoints for one dose, you recycle the significance level and you can test the other, um, end, uh, the other dose 
at possibly a higher significance level. In addition, if you are able to reject, um, say, H1 and H1 prime, then the dashed lines tells you that you can then test H7 at a specific significance level. And likewise, H2 and H2 prime, you can then test H8 at a specific significance level. And you see that between H7 and H8, you also have some recycling of significance level uh, being built in. Um, the complication here is that um, I cannot easily tell you at which level H7 or H8 are tested because this depends on whether you're rejecting all three uh, endpoints for a dose, and therefore you can use a higher significance level, for example, for H2. If you can reject H1, H3, and H5, to have a higher significance level for H2, which could then be propagated to H8. So it's a bit more complicated. And so if you, and, and the team, what they did, they really walked through all the possible um, decision outcomes, all possible decision outcomes, and kind of calculate manually what would be the significance level for which hypothesis under different passes. Um, so we didn't find a simple way, a shortcut procedure, um, like a graphical approach for that. We didn't find that part. Yeah. But the, I think the concepts are clear. So you can extend the whole idea to multiple doses and multiple endpoints. Another extension is, um, is, is, is I liked it a bit. Um, this is just a very recent one um, where you could, I think that comes from the, from the team. They said, oh, we can kill two birds with one stone, poor birds. Um, the idea is that, um, so we have um, diabetic retinopathy is the underlying disease, but certain patients with DR, they will evolve into a new disease called DME, um, diabetic macular edema. And so that is what is called DR in DME. So in the end, um, we were interested in developing a drug for DME, but also for DR in DME. So these are treated as two different diseases. Okay. And we would like, um, now the idea was that we would run two pivotal trials, but only with endpoints um, within each trial related to DME, and then having a pooled analysis for the DR in DME. So the DR in DME is a slightly different disease, but it has its own endpoints. So the basic idea is that we have, we file a single dossier, but for both related indications, DME and DR in DME, based on two sets of endpoints from the two confirmatory trials. So, what, so instead of having two separate submissions, one for DME and one for DR in DME, we do a joint analysis, like an overall testing scheme for both indications as part of one single submission dossier. And we would use the two confirmatory studies on the individual study level for the DME indication in their testing strategy. And on the project level, we would then incorporate the endpoint relevant for DI and DME, which is a very different endpoint and much harder one. And the testing strategy actually looks then very similar to what you've just seen before. For DME, we have a per study sequence of hypothesis tests that serves for one submission. And for DI and DME, we have a different endpoint and using a pooled analysis, uh, which we would only perform after having rejected H1 and H1 prime in DME. So um, I don't know whether it's, there are any ophthalmologists uh, here or who have worked in this area. Um, it, it, this concept of DM and DR and DME took me a while to understand, but um, yeah, it, it, this, this actually uh, FDA initially requested two separate um, analysis and having two separate studies and having two separate submission dossiers and everything being separate. But um, yeah, we talked them through this graph and through this concept and they finally accepted it um, for our fighting strategy. So currently um, it's not yet approved, but um, the FDA accepted this as a testing strategy and it's in the public domain. So I can talk openly about it. Good. Um, so. Coming to the end of my presentation, um, I proposed several test strategies based on a few key principles and depending on the role of pooled analysis. Um, something it's more on the logistical side, the pooled analysis would have to be done in a very timely manner if both studies are finished simultaneously 
um, there was one interesting aspect is that um, the pooled analysis should not be uh, pre-specified as your study testing strategy, especially of your clinical trial protocol, because if the other trial has not yet finished and you have your pooled analysis as part of your study level analysis, like somehow in your testing scheme, then um, you cannot formally continue testing with your first study that already finished because you have to wait for the results of the other study. This was um, actually came up in one of our studies internally and it created kind of a problem, so to speak. So we would suggest that while you can draw the graphs that have, we have shown, you are very clear what is the analysis on a study level and that is what you put in the protocol. And then you have a separate document describing what is your pooled analysis strategy um, just for this, yeah, for the, um, for the hard endpoints. So that's an important aspect to consider. And then um, the pooled analysis relies on independent substantiation. Um, the efficiency of the pooled analysis may, might be outweighed by risk of inconsistency. So for example, the two studies are of these different designs or slightly different designs or have slightly different populations because you're recruiting from different regions of the world. But then, you know, there's a nice paper from my colleagues 20 years ago discussing a consistency requirement for testing the pooled analysis. So, um, you know, nowhere in, in my presentation, I was kind of limiting um, to which type of analysis we're doing. I was just talking about the multiplicity aspects. But, you know, if you're interested in consistency requirement, I guess I would suggest going back to that paper. Um, a few references, and I would like to think um, the various teams that um, brought the interesting case studies with us to us. Um, you see here's these three case studies that I presented, the ophthalmology one, the multiple sclerosis, and then the one where this is still ongoing and I couldn't disclose the indication. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Frank, for a really interesting talk. So we will now go to questions. So while our questions will work, um, if you're in the room, then please raise your hand and Alison will have a handheld mic so you can ask a question. If you are online, then likewise, please raise your virtual hand and Alison can unmute you and uh, you can ask your questions. Uh, so while, while we're waiting, I, I'll start. Um, so I guess going back to this issue of identical design, um, could you say a bit more about how identical they need to be, I guess, uh, for, for these kind of considerations. Yeah, yeah. so um, I think for the multiplicity part, at least uh, what you need to have identical is the same endpoints and the same hierarchy of the endpoints, so to speak, so you can utilize the same hierarchy of testing, like the same multiplicity scheme across the two studies, I guess. Or, although you could probably also, well, what you really need is your, your gatekeeping H1 and H1 prime that needs really to be the same hypothesis, right? Um, so I think that you need some, some uh, identicality here. Um, then um, the poolability of the trials obviously um, raises a lot of issues, right? And if you have, um, you know, ideally you're recruiting the same patients in the same, in the same inclusion, exclusion criteria in the same centers um, and all this in the same time, right? Not that I, one study takes one year, the other one takes two years. So all of this, I think, goes into that. But from a multiple testing point of view, these are all issues that I, that I was happily ignoring. Um, all what I need is really that you use the same endpoints so you can apply those testing strategies. But for the appli actual application, you need to be careful about the poolability of the studies. Great, thanks. Um, Ash. Yeah, thanks, great talk. Um, just wondering about uh, the pooled analysis. Is, is there any power consideration? Is there any potential loss of power? Um, it seems like a pretty stringent threshold to so yeah um, so you've done simulation studies to yeah. see if yeah. possible yeah. so in this in this study and that's documented in this new England Journal of medicine paper indeed he said um randomizing 900 patients gives you 90 percent power in each trial for the analyzed relapse rate but indeed if you then combine the data and that continues in that paper 1800 patients obviously it's twice the size um, well, then you would have 90 and 80% power for this disability worsening, worsening after three or six months based on this threshold that we had used here, which is alpha minus alpha square. So um, in this case, it's not, it's not so stringent because you use a bond for only split 
You know, you have eight, for example, in the first line, you have H3, H3 prime, each tested at alpha because they're independent. That gives you alpha squared. And so if you use a bond bonus split, you have to subtract the alpha squared from alpha, which gives you almost a level alpha test. Yeah, and that's why that is possible. Mm -hmm. Um, here you go. We'll go there. Um, thank you for the talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, I was actually going to ask a question about, about this slide. Um, in the secondary hypotheses, um, is there a particular, is there a reason for the directionality in the, the fact that the very last ones were the ones that failed? Is that not a coincidence? Uh, this, I could make a joke now, actually, I wanted to say that during the presentation, but I didn't make it, but maybe I make it now. It's a wonderful clinical team, which really could foresee, had a crystal ball. Mm -hmm. So it was pre-specified. Um, I don't know how they came up with that sequence, but it really worked out very well. Um, yeah, thanks to the clinical team understanding it. But yeah, more seriously, they ha you have to pre-specify the sequence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sophia. Yeah, I have two questions. Sorry, thank you, Frank. That was a really nice talk. I have two questions. One more practical, which is, what's the relationship between the primary endpoints and the secondary endpoints in the sense of correlation that I might be seeing yeah. and how does this affect this? And the second one is, could you say a bit more about, you said this is not the only solution and there are many more reasons to keep thinking of this. So uh, could you say a few more words as to what direction to think about that? Okay. Um, yeah, so the first question, yeah, they will be correlated, but um, and maybe for the power calculation, it's important to cal include the correlation if you want to understand, yeah. Uh, but for your type 1 error rate, it might not, so, not, not be so important because we do this hierarchical level alpha tests, and, and therefore you have full significance level for your primary, and then within your study, you test your next level, uh, next hypothesis again at level alpha if you rejected the one previous and so on. So I think the correlation does not kick in for the type one area control, but for the power simulations, for sure. And quite honestly, I don't know how they calculated these power values of 90 and 80%. Um, I think this was, yeah, I don't know whether they had this sequential testing in their built in the correlation. I don't know that part. Mm -hmm. um, the other question is, yeah, so I feel this is um, not yet fully like very fundamentally laid out because I was a bit vague what is, I mean exactly by submission wise error rate. Uh, what, you know, I, I think one had to, one would have to be a bit clearer. Um, um, yeah, um, I, I think it's not yet like we don't have any, um, how should I say, we, we didn't fully flesh out the notation and the, um, you know, um, proof, so to speak. It's more like testing strategies that seem to be reasonable. Um, I think one would have to be more, uh, yeah, more fundamental to say what are exactly the type one error that, that one is controlling, so to speak. Yeah, and what do you mean by this independent substitution? Is that only for your H one and H one prime at the beginning? Is that you know? I, I think there's more than one can, one could talk about. And then, um, yeah, um, but I have to say I haven't seen many other proposals in the literature. I just feel that um, this is not yet like. A, you know, there's not yet, a, 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 you know, a well-justified framework yet. It's intuitive, but it's not yet laid out in terms of the mathematics. I think that's what I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. Actually, when preparing the presentation, I shared it with my colleague, Dong Chi, and we were not clear whether, or at least I was not clear, he was making a comment um, at one of the slides, whether we're controlling the family-wise air rate or the submission-wise air rate. So I think it was really not clear what we exactly mean by, I think it was on, on another slide here. Um, yeah. Anyway, so this is, yeah, I think it was the slide uh, we, had, we had some discussion. So because we simply didn't lay it completely out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the two papers that we are quoting is more like um, like this Brett Small and she, it, it's just one section out of several other sections. So we never had a dedicated paper. So, mm -hmm. so what I'm saying is anyone interested in joining? So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. a very interesting talk and um, okay in relation to this slide um, you propose this approach the um, submission wise error rate typically focusing on h1 but you are testing in the two separate st studies also h2 and also h3 yeah can you extend the approach for looking at h2 also so at h1 refers to the endpoint E1, H2, E2. 
right? Yes. But when you do the pooled analysis, you always focus on H1. So I guess on the endpoint E1. So the H2 tilde, I'm not sure whether I'm getting the question. H2 tilde is for- H2 here, Yeah, right? it's probably small. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. H2 tilde, okay. this is H1 and H1 prime, this is H3 and H3 prime. Okay, so the pooled analysis refers to one of the endpoints only. It refers to E2, so this is E1, so you okay. see we have three endpoints, E1, right. E2, and H3. Right. So these two are for E1, mm -hmm. this one is for E2, okay. and these two is, are for E3. Okay, and how are those related? The endpoints? Like, no. Yes, so you have an assumption like um, that the endpoint E2 is somehow in the middle between E1 and E3, so it's like um, yeah. there is an ordinal assumption, as Sophia asked. So yeah. you are somehow have an assumption that the endpoints are ordered, and you are only testing a hypothesis if um, conditioning on the success of yeah. the yeah. previous hypothesis. Okay, yeah. so you can only do this full analysis on an endpoint which is somehow in the middle. Yeah, and this is probably the part that I, as part of my answer to the last question, we did not formally write it out, out so to speak, is all very intuitive. So, um, but I, I think the intuition that we have is to say H1 and H1 prime, this is for E1, this is the primary endpoint. Okay. If you don't get independent substantiation or replication, so if you don't have H1 and H1 prime both significant, then you cannot, you're not allowed to test H2 tilde. Mm -hmm. So H2 tilde is, um, becomes only relevant after you have also your primary endpoint um, rejected, but also in both studies. So this is the meaning of these two solid lines without, without the number, without the weight. So H2 tilde is a key secondary endpoint for H following to H1 and H2 mm -hmm. prime on a project level. Mm -hmm. But on the study level, H2 tilde is not, is not important. What is important on the study level is H3 and H3 prime for E3. Right. So that- So as a secondary analysis, you ask, okay, what if you can also test this other end? Yes, yes, you can test H3 as soon as you, even within the study, you can test E3, H3, mm -hmm. as soon as you reject H1. You don't need this substantiation mm -hmm. anymore. You need the substantiation only on the project level, on the submission level, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and that's exactly where we didn't, um, you know, lay out the, you know, the, this notation and the explicit mathematical details. We didn't do that. Yeah. Okay. So that's missing, so to speak. But is it intuitively clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's clear now. Yeah. I was missing all the indexes yeah. that are there. Yeah. So in that sense, H2 tilde is not in the middle of H1 and H1 prime, mm -hmm. but it, it is a secondary endpoint, but it's not within a study, but it's, it's serving a different purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I guess one of the order I got here is a temporal order, because I've seen that like all the endpoints somehow where one was more proximal and the other one was more distal endpoint. Say again. Or I'm wrong. Um, so if you if we go on slide, I think eighteen maybe. Eighteen. Okay. Yes. Uh, 18. This is 18. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so I was looking at some of the endpoints and it seems that the, the hard endpoints are the one which come um, in a shorter time. And then in a longer time, yes. Exactly, so this is yep. kind of these are, these are the ones. So this is the three months hard endpoint mm -hmm. disability and this is the six months disability. Right. And if we go back on slide 18, yes, I was looking again here at the, like at the power, but it's unclear to me whether we are referring to the same endpoints or to different endpoints. Like, okay. so we are saying randomizing uh, 900 patients per trial will provide more than 90% power. And, okay, ARR. Is ARR the same as risk of disability. No, ARR is here, analyzed mm -hmm. relapse rate, that's the primary endpoint. Okay. So this is what I had here, you okay, see, so, analyzed. So how can I compare like the power 
uh, given by the nine, 900 patients and the power given by um, 1,800. Yeah. Because they are different, they are different in points. Yes, right? they are. Okay, yes. So I cannot say which one will provide more power. Um, so <laughs> the, yeah. So if you do the power calculation, yeah, um, like for just one trial, just mm -hmm. for H one, for ARR, you have your standard assumption was a forty percent reduction in ARR or something like that. Then you need would need nine hundred patients to achieve the ninety percent power. Okay. So this is what the first bullet point said. Okay. If you do the same 900 patients, but yeah. you would look into H2, just 900, then you, and, but you wanted to test H2, you wouldn't have sufficient power. That's why you need to pull the data and you get 1,800 patients, and then you are able to get a meaningful clinical difference to reject. Okay. So yeah, I guess I was missing the part that the endpoint is referred to a secondary analysis. Yes. Yes. And it's not the same, so mm -hmm. I was making this comparison. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, I think I'll ask one last question before we finish. Uh, so within the graphical approach, we can calculate adjusted feedback. Yes. So I was wondering, had you thought about calculating submission-wise adjusted p-values? Yeah, this is another great um, gap. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, no, I, I wanted to go here. So we first, we don't even don't have a graphical approach. What you see here is not the typical graphical approach. Um, so that would be something. And what I was saying on the previous slide or on the next slide, all confidence intervals and p-values were presented without adjustment because we didn't know how to do things. Yeah. Okay. So there are many open gaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much, Frank. Let's thank speak again for a great talk. And <laughs>